Listen, ma'am, you are absolutely right. It, it, it is shameful. And, and President Obama, for seven years, his pattern has been to ignore, to alienate, and abandon our friends and to coddle and appease our enemies. The Castro brothers, listen, I know this firsthand. My father was imprisoned and tortured by Batista in Cuba, and my aunt, my Tia Sonia, was imprisoned and tortured by Castro. They are vicious murderers. They are communist totalitarian dictators. They hate America. They are spreading terrorism throughout Latin America. They are close allies with North Korea and other enemies of this country. And Obama has thrown the Castros a lifeline of billions of dollars that they will only use to undermine American interests. He's doing the same thing to Iran. Every enemy of America gets billions of dollars courtesy of the Obama administration. It doesn't make any sense at all. And by the way, he's going to Cuba, but somehow Obama can't find time to go to Justice Scalia's funeral. And you know what? A couple of years ago, somehow Obama couldn't find time to go to Margaret Thatcher's funeral either. You look at historical figures who changed the course of history. And this president says, if you're not a leftist progressive, he's got no time for you. I'll tell you this, that's going to end January 2017. All right, yes, ma'am, final question. Thank you for that question, and thank you for being here. Incredibly important question, what should we do about Social Security? Listen, Social Security, we've got politicians in Washington in both parties that are kicking the can down the road that are refusing to address this problem. And I think what they're doing is wrong for a long time. It used to be that Social Security was viewed as the third rail of politics. You touch it, you get electrocuted. Well, not only am I touching it, I'm embracing it and hugging it tight. Because I think we have a responsibility to step in and strengthen and preserve Social Security. So let me tell you how. Social Security reform should follow four principles. Number one, for seniors, for those on Social Security or near retirement, there should be no changes whatsoever, nothing. We have made promises. People have ordered their financial affairs counting on those promises, and we need to honor every single word of the promises made to our seniors. But for younger workers, look, I'm 45. It is hard to find someone my age who thinks Social Security will be there for us. Now that presents a real opportunity. When you've got a whole generation that understands this is insolvent unless we step in and fix it, it presents an opportunity for meaningful reform. And for younger workers, reform should follow three principles. Number one, for younger workers, we should gradually raise the retirement age to recognize people are living longer and to give people time to plan on it and save accordingly. Number two, for younger workers, we should change the rate of growth for Social Security benefits so that they match inflation rather than exceeding inflation. Now, those two changes alone bring Social Security into solvency. But the third reform is critical. For younger workers, we ought to allow them to keep a portion of your tax payments in a personal account that you own, you control, like a 401k, and you can give it to your kids and grandkids. <laughs> Let me wrap up with this. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank Mutt's Barbecue for hosting us, for allowing us to be here. And I want to say to each of you, if you agree with me, that the stakes have never been higher. That it's now or never that we are standing at the edge of a cliff staring down. And if we keep going in the same direction another four or eight more years, we risk doing irreparable damage to the greatest country in the history of the world. If you agree with me, then I want to ask you to do three things. Number one, join us. Commit to come out on Saturday, vote in the Republican primary, and stand with us. Number two, bring others. Commit right now to pick up the phone. Call your mom. 
It's actually a good idea to call your mom anyway. <laughs> call your sister or your son or your next door neighbor, your business partner, your college roommate. Say this election matters. It matters to me, it matters to my kids, it matters to my grandkids. If everyone here goes and gets nine other people to vote on Saturday, everyone here will have voted 10 times. Let me, let me tell you, if any of you are not yet old enough to vote, if you get 10 other people to vote on Saturday, you will have voted 10 times before you turn 18. <laughs> That's how we win. Listen, y'all have been subjected to millions of dollars in attack ads, of TV ads, of radio ads, of mailers, of nonsense and mud and garbage. The time for that media noise is over. This is our time. This race, I believe, will be decided friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, pastor to pastor, South Carolinian to South Carolinian. And if everyone here brings nine other people to vote on Saturday, the men and women gathered here in Mutt's Barbecue can change the outcome of the South Carolina Republican primary. If conservatives stand together, we will win the Republican nomination. And if we stand together, we will defeat Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or whatever socialist they throw up and we'll turn this country around. And the third thing I want to ask of each of you is that you pray that you commit today to pray for this country, to lift this country up each and every day from now to election day. To say simply, Father God, please continue this awakening. Continue this spirit of revival. Awaken the body of Christ that we might pull back from the abyss. We are here today standing on the promises of 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear their prayers from heaven and forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Let me tell you a bit of history that our friends in the mainstream media will never tell you. In January 1981, when Ronald Reagan took the oath of office, his left hand was resting on 2 Chronicles 714, a very real and concrete manifestation of that promise from the Word of God. We have faced these challenges before. We have faced the abyss before. And the American people came together and pulled this country back. We have done it before. And if we stand together as one in South Carolina, we can do it again. Thank you.